welcome to the Modern People Eater, Nadia. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. I did listen to a few other podcasts, including Katie Burks. I mean, huge fan of hers. So did listen to that one and really loved it. So really just very grateful to be here. And we're excited Boys. to have you. I think it was Sarah Gorshow who who recommended that we reach out. I think she said that she had like cold DM'd you a while back on LinkedIn and y'all connected and she was like, you need to talk to Nadia. Am I getting that story That's right? You are. I When I saw Sarah's name in the email, I just felt like really grateful. It's so awesome when you get to sort of build a community through other amazing people leaders. I feel like this role can be really lonely, but that makes it so much fun. So yeah, we did connect on a few fun topics. Um, always soundboarding, cool ideas in the back end. Um, and I think we belong to a few communities, like similar communities, and that's how we, we connected as well, LinkedIn and communities. Community has, that has been one of my personal kind of pillars for the year. And, uh, and so I'd love to hear that you all are not only connected one-on-one, -on -one, but also through, through communities and on our, on our list of to do's is expanding the modern people leader community in Europe. And so, so this is one small step in doing that. So we, uh, we're really, really excited about today's conversation. And so as you, you've listened to a few episodes, we have a very specific format. We have a lot of traditions and rituals in the Modern People Leader. The first one we have is a good news story. And it's just a personal or work-related story from the past couple of weeks that, uh, that we want to kick things off with. Would you like good to stuff. go first, yeah. Nadia? Okay. Yeah, I, I have a fun one. This is a good story, but it's also that like realization of... Uh, having children and, and raising kids in 2023. So I had this bright idea to send my kids off volunteering this holiday at a library. I think they expected something way more exciting than that. And so apparently it was an awful experience and they had to like clean and scrub this library and every shelf. I think it was a very meaningful experience and they're going to remember this moment in future. They are privileged. I mean, they, they live in a beautiful home in a great suburb out here in Johannesburg, but it was a little bit funny when they came home and they were like, why did you send us to a library? We could have gone to help puppies at a, at, at some sort of like care center or shelter. And I think that that is very much what kids think. I think they think, adult life is all shiny and there's all these like amazing things that just happen. I think it was a really healthy like reality check for both of them and a little bit humoristic to me for them to come home and realize, look, it's not hard work is part and parcel of a future career and I want them to stay humble. So I'm really trying to do more of that. So yeah, fun, light story. The library was super thankful. I mean, they made them work and got a lot of impact through that two hours or three hours they were there and they're young they're 10 and 13 so early days for doing stuff like that I worked very early on and so I learned so much through that I learned so much ownership through that early early life and I hope to install that yeah I think those are good experiences I wasn't quite volunteering but when I was growing up my mom ran an assisted living and uh not like the the most fun place to be for a kid and she would she would bring me with her in the summers to go with her to work, and uh, she would she would put me to work. I'd have to like you know wheel people to and from their their rooms to the to the dining room. She would just have me do like various tasks, and I just always remember like being so annoyed that I even had to do anything. I'd like I was like I'd rather just be sitting in your room on my Game Boy or whatever I had at the time. <laughs> but those those experiences definitely stick with you. Yeah, I think so what too. I. What I love about your good news, Nadia, is I, I co-parent two daughters and I, I talk about them all the time. One of my, my main jobs, my, my most important job on my LinkedIn profile is proud dad. Um, and your good news story today is giving me hope <laughs> because the good news, my, my daughters are 11 and 13, so not very similar ages. And they also live a very privileged life. They have a great, two great homes and all the things and everything that kids would want and more. And, uh, and they, it's a very similar experience. So we did a, a, a day in the park where we had to take a bunch of dirt and mulch 
and spread it. And let's just say I had to check in with them several times to make sure they were doing the work. <laughs> and so whether you're in Austin, Texas, or Johannesburg, South Africa, you know, I, the good news is like, um, you know, I, you know, there are shared experiences here and, and shared uh, opportunities. So Absolutely. that's awesome. Daniel, do you want to go next? Yeah, I can go next. So as I was telling y'all before we we hit record, I was I was sick from like Sunday up until yesterday. And it was one of those uh, stomach bugs or maybe it was like food contamination. I was traveling this past weekend. And on Sunday when I first got sick, it was the worst I've ever felt in my life, like 10 of 10 uncomfortable. And there's like no better feeling than feeling just normal. And it kind of just like, I don't know, level sets everything. It's like, oh, like I, I could, I should just be happy that like I have my health and that I feel normal right now. And, um, you know, t this morning I woke up and I feel a hundred percent and it's just a good feeling. And I'm just thankful that, that like, you know, the worst thing that I'm dealing with today is allergies. I'm like, I can handle that if I just went through the last three days. So that's my good news. Glad you're much better. And you're right. Health is everything, right? Everything else matters a little bit less, um, including work. When it comes to a 10 out of 10, like sick feeling. So really happy you're better. Agreed. And I was like feeling a bit uh, down on myself the past couple of days because I wasn't able to do as much work. But I think it was worth getting the rest. Like, I don't even think I would have been able to put in quality work had I been trying to do stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Glad you're feeling better. Yeah, glad you're feeling better. So my good news is I still have to be a bit cryptic, but I've talked, you know, for our the audience that are our regulars that that are listening to every episode, I've been talking for months about big news, big big initiative, big milestone, and um <clears throat> let's say the milestone is now behind us. And uh oh. I I can't quite share details yet but yeah as of this week the milestone is is behind us behind me and you know it, it it's i have a wide range of emotions right now like i feel like i um am grinning from ear to ear um uh, but also could could cry at any any moment and so the uh the the feeling is is more positive than sad but it it is this weird range of emotions i was describing to one of my mentors last night. And so, so my good news is we're here, we made it and all the hard work has paid off. So more to come on the details. So tune in if, uh, if you want to learn more about what I just got through, what we just got through. So, um, anyhow, let, let's get to the, we have a lot of great things to talk about. Nadia, you have an amazing background. You are what I would call like a LinkedIn famous type of influencer. You've worked at amazing brands. And, you know, I, I call this our Brene Brown question because she starts a lot of her podcasts with what, what's your story? Like, tell us about you. We want to know about you and the amazing things that were part of your journey and how all that led to you becoming the head of people and culture at Hess Gorilla. I'm going to try and make it as short as possible because it's it's quite a story and I'm sure I can write about it one day and hopefully I do. Someone actually gave me a name for my future book. I'm not going to say it here. This is a podcast, but I'm hoping one day I can write this, this all down. I had my own amazing little business here in South Africa. The economy wasn't easy. It was a very saturated market. I don't think I was making any money. Actually, I know I wasn't making any, any money. My accountant told me. And I, I reached a point where I wasn't feeling like I was actually being impactful in that saturated sort of exec search and a bit of HR consulting space. And I did, I've always been interested in international work. I did have one or two customers that were American that had offices that they helped that, that I helped create in places like Cape Town and Italy and Poland, and they had their head office in Atlanta. And so really, really like fun experience, but the something bigger was missing for me. And I take, I took a huge risk and I literally had like one evening decided to search for new work. And I had a chat with hubby, Chris, he lives here with me in Johannesburg with our two kids. And I came across GitLab on like a Boolean string and GitLab literally changed my entire life, my career, the way I work, the way I think. 
And getting that role was just, it was next level. Working with someone like Sid, the CEO of GitLab still today, was incredible. And I think part of the reason I've been so successful in remote and distributed teams is actually thanks to a great CEO like him. And I think that's what I choose throughout my career. So as we continue this journey, I do like working with great CEOs. And there's a, I'm starting to to see what what those things are that I look for before I look for a new role or before or if someone approaches me about amazing about an amazing opportunity. But GitLab was a true success story for me. I learned so much about distributed work, working with hundreds of different cultures, scaling a company company from 70 to 1,300 people in more than 75 countries. And then using that and impacting remote. So remote.com is an EOR. And I spent two years there with Yope, um, who's the CEO there, an amazing CEO once again. What a privilege to work with someone that cares that much, that much about people. And that entire journey so uh, set me up for success where I am now. I only left remote because I had this need to build again. I know in a journey, like in a in a VP of people or head of people or CPO level, there's only that amount of times, once you hit that level, right, that you can go back and build from scratch again. After that, you become very strategic. You tend to do some board advisory work. I'm already doing some, some of that. And I think long-term future, I would want to do more of that. So right now, I took this opportunity at Test Gorilla to work with Vauta and Otto, our two co-founders, to really build again one more time and to build an amazing company that is working asynchronously and remotely in more than 31 countries that only has 130 people. So that's where I'm at. I, I also have to work for a company where I really align to the product. So that bigger mission, there has to be a bigger mission and a bigger impact. GitLab being an open source and open core company, which taught me about open source HR and open source people. And remote, very similar mission actually to Test Gorilla. They want everyone to get amazing opportunity to land their dream job. And so that accessibility, both those companies create in the world of work is probably why I work for companies like them and why I'm here. And so Love now it. I'm head of people. Yeah, a head of people and culture at Test Gorilla at the moment. That's amazing. And what a great story to have like, that one opportunity. And I believe that a strength that is not often talked about is the ability to see an opportunity when you're at a, a crossroads in your career. Some people, you know, some people it's very obvious, like, oh, there's an opportunity here. You know, I, you know, I need to, I need to, there's something here I need to look at. Uh, while others, you know, just remain heads down and they keep plowing forward. And so I do believe it's a skill to A, see an opportunity when you're at a crossroads in your career and, and B, have the courage to take that jump, take that leap. There were probably many others that had found this role at GitLab, but you had the courage to take it and go for it. And of course, you had an amazing track record and all the skills and experiences that you needed. And so I, I love that because I've had very similar inflection points in my career as well. One thing that that jumped out of me in your in your journey is your your comments about working with great CEOs, and you've worked with some truly great CEOs. These companies that that, that you've worked for are are innovators in their space. And so, you know, what are some of the traits that you look for? You know, when when you think great CEO, you know, looking back, are there any commonalities in their work styles, in their behaviors? You know, what anything you can share there? Yeah, I think it is the human and people factor. It is that deep care and understanding that your biggest asset is the people that you're going to be hiring and that you're going to be working with day to day. I think something else that's potentially like for many people, not a big thing, but it's a big thing for me is a CEO that has a great life outside of work. Because if they're not advocating for that, chances are they're simply going to be working 24 seven. And that's an awful environment to be in. And so all three of these current amazing CEOs I've worked for had great lives outside of work and they celebrated that very openly, right? You could see them taking PTO and disappearing for two weeks and literally taking time off. You could see them sharing a random picture of them going somewhere with their family or skiing or going on vacation or doing like cycling or something that 
that they're deeply interested in and spending a little bit of time on that versus growth at all cost, I think is a huge attraction to me and to work with them. I care about really integrating my work into my life. I don't think there's balance. Like I don't think balance exists in 2023. That's part, partly why we have nonlinear days now in the world of work. But I do think that integration cannot be life into work. It's got to be work into life to reach a certain level of fulfillment, right? And I know that's difficult, especially if you're just starting out or someone that's truly in a career that doesn't have good pay, that is like really difficult hours or difficult situation. But I think that's what, if I would tell anyone what to seek for in great co-founders and CEOs, it's that opportunity to integrate your li- your work into your life. And then something that's really working right now, and another reason why I wanted to work with Vauta and Otto, the co-founder of Test Gorilla, was that both GitLab and Remote, and that was their journey and it remains their journey, were going through hyper growth. I have never experienced meaningful growth, like slower. Well, I wouldn't, I, I don't know if slow is the right way of describing it, but meaningful means we are not going to hire 800 people in one year. We're not going to try and build all the things in one product. We have a very clear trajectory. We want to meet that. And we're probably going to have a more meaningful growth opportunity. And so I'm excited to experience that side of building because I haven't had a chance to do that in startup. Um, yeah. Love it. Absolutely love it. And so let's talk a little bit about Test Gorilla, right? Because that's your your current job. How long have you been at Test Gorilla now? Two months. So Ooh. quite fresh. <laughs> still still yeah. in the first 90 days. And and I think we we we're gonna we're gonna dig into that a little bit here. So tell us a little bit about the business. You know, if you were at a party with your with friends and family or at the dinner table uh, on a holiday and a family member were to ask, oh. Test Gorilla, tell us about the your your new company. You know, how would you describe what uh, what you do? Yeah, so imagine you have these amazing companies that don't focus on experience and qualifications only when they hire someone, and imagine they can assess people to check what skills they have and how it, what it would be like to work with them. And so, I would hate to call it a test. I think if I would describe it as an assignment. To a group of people, it would probably make more sense. Imagine through an assignment or an assessment, you'll be able to discover what it would be like to work with them, what skills they have. I think that's what we do. We really focus on skills and competency-based hiring. I had to explain it to my kids. My 13-year-old is very interested in tech, startups, products. And so if I had to describe it to him in that way, he's going to ask me 10 more questions. And so for him, I I literally said, it's a remote company that works in a very distributed fashion across 31 countries with no single office in the world. And we are basically removing the CV from hiring. And he was like, what is a CV? So there will, there will always be questions about it, but I think it's about skills and competency-based hiring instead of just focusing on someone's qualifications and experience. I do think the accessibility factor is something I'm not good at describing yet, especially to a group of people at a party. But I think for me, it's about the accessibility it creates, right? So we have the opportunity to create accessibility for folks that didn't study at that amazing university in the US, but maybe studied in Kenya at a college. And so, yeah, I think the accessibility test Gorilla is creating is what excites me in the world of work and providing that accessibility to our 9,000 plus customers now. So it's grown since last time we spoke. Um, Yeah, I think I'm excited about that. Well, and just knowing that you have the brands that you have worked for and the missions, the vision, the values of those companies, I I'm excited for you and I'm excited to learn more about Test Gorilla because I know that you chose, you know, you had options and you chose Test Gorilla for a reason. And so on that note, you know, why should we be jealous that that you get to work at Test Gorilla and and we we aren't? Yeah. So again, those two co-founders have lives outside of work, which means there's a deep care for the human factor. Um, it's an extremely um accessible environment. I find like talking to anyone at any level is amazing. So if if you're an individual contributor, not necessarily in leadership, you can easily still gain access to one of the co-founders, which is healthy and good. So that human factor is a huge attraction for me. 
I think building a product at this at Series A in this economy is quite a challenge. And so the level of ambition that comes with that without growth at all costs, right, is a cool combination. So many companies would just like trajectory, growth at all costs. We're not doing that in this tough stage of the economy. And so that excites me. We can still be super ambitious and bold, but we have a clear trajectory. We know what we're doing this year. We're excited about that and we're keeping ourselves ac accountable. So you've already mentioned a couple of things that excite you about the role are, you know, you mentioned the meaningful growth. You mentioned building a series, a product in this economy, like it's an exciting challenge to tackle. Is there anything else? I mean, uh, you know, being somebody that at GitLab and, and at remote, you're building in public, um, you're part of the open source HR movement, and you were doing a lot of things that really hadn't ever been done before and kind of providing a template for other people out there. Is there anything in that vein that attracted you to Test Gorilla? Absolutely. Um, Test Gorilla hasn't had a head of people before. And so I have this unique opportunity to really build from scratch. There's been amazing folks um, that helped out in the role uh, that certainly contributed a ton to getting the right things in place really early on, right? But I get to build like, how do we work asynchronously together every day? Because 90% of culture is about how you work together. There's a lot of components to that. But if you can get if you can get that right, those foundations about asynchronous distributed work, I think I'm excited about building that. If I can open source it, Daniel, today, I just would. I love open source HR. I actually love open core companies. I understand why all companies can't be open source fully, right? And I understand why GitLab was open source. Remote allowed me to take their handbook and just create and build in public. I I love that I never had to ask permission, including tough things like, for example, building an anti-harassment policy from scratch publicly and making that available to anyone that needs an anti-harassment policy that has a thousand people in 75 countries, which is quite complex. If you can imagine the amount of things you need to cover in that, right? To meet all the, not just compliance requirements, but to keep everyone safe, different cultures, different beliefs, different religions, different people. And so, at remote, I feel like I, I could really just go and do that. At Test Gorilla, we don't have a public handbook yet. We have a careers page that has a lot of transparency. But I think I have the opportunity to create something like that here. And why not share? Why not create an experience and share these skills with other people in the world of people and work and culture? And so I get to build a team. I get to share all these skills with them. And I feel like, I always felt, felt like at remote, anyone that's worked with me in that team will probably be able to do the exact same thing at another company. And so that excites me. It's, it's not just me being able to build, it's also about sharing that skill, building companies that really understands how these things work. And yeah, if I can do it in public, even better. Listening to you talk, Nadia, it, I also have a shared passion that that I should admit. And the future, there are a lot of questions about what is in store for me in the future. A lot of my friends, a lot of my family, you know, Daniel and I have had conversations and, you know, I don't know exactly what the future, what the future looks like, but I do know what I am extremely interested in. And I'm starting to begin to understand like, okay, you know, I don't know, uh, a uh, a product or uh, a company or place or anything like that. But I do know whatever future business I am a part of, it has to be open source. It has to be asynchronous and it has to be fully remote. And, and the reason why is because I believe that that, that is the future. And I don't think in-person goes away, but I think m what does happen is the, the types of businesses that you're describing will grow in in terms of the to the overall percentage of all the companies out there and we're, I feel like we're still in the infancy and those that are mastering this way of working are going to have a competitive advantage and so like that like I share that like that passion and that excitement and just hearing you talk is just making me even more excited and so so thank you for sharing why you've chosen to work at these organizations and why Test Grill is so unique 
Yeah, that's a great point. On the on that topic, the other thing it does, it creates folks that are completely self-enabled. So not only am I building all these amazing things with the team that I get to work with, but the entire company start realizing how empowering it is and how enabling it is to work at companies like that. And so what's what's really nice is they nearly start demanding it in a really healthy way and start saying, hey, like we also need documentation wherever they go next. And so it's this beautiful effect. It's it's no longer um, disruption. I think it is redefining. So it's it's a lot more refined and it is about redefining what works really well in asynchronous work. And so, yeah, I, at that self-enablement is something I'm obsessed with. If If I had to beg and plead, you know, folks to complete things or to update the information that would be really difficult but what if I create it in a way where they simply just can do it and it's not on me you know so again time zones I think the it's, it's part of accessibility it's part of that self enable enablement mindset and that leads me to there's a section in GitLab's handbook called manager of one I will probably never forget that and what I remember reading there look they iterate on it all the time they create merge requests in their product and update it all the time. So it stays so current and beautiful, but I'll never forget what the meaning of manager of one was to me and how much it taught me about this flexibility that came with distributed companies. So that's exciting. I also like how you mentioned that part of what excites you about the test gorilla opportunity is that you're going to get to teach your people team, the, these skills that you've learned at places like GitLab and remote and it just makes me think about people like you and Darren Murph and Shelby Wolpa, all the people that have these skills building out fully distributed teams. And the more places they go, or in Shelby's case, the more companies that she consults, more people are exposed to what this could look like. And then the people that work there, they go work somewhere else. And then now they're you know implementing those, those same practices. So I just wanted to point that out as well. So... Um, you're about 90 days in, and yeah. I imagine you've learned a lot about the company in, in your first three months, um, and I'm sure you've probably gone on some sort of like listening tour. Are there, are there like any, you know, quick wins that, that you're, you're spotting that, that you're excited to tackle? Yeah, so the asynchronous work guide I mentioned earlier, I'm actually working on that right now. It's nearly ready to ship. Um, I also want to add a few templates in there and, and help guide what asynchronous work looks like at Test Gorilla. I think what happens when you don't have a clear guideline for async work or how they how you work together in distributed fashion, whatever you call it in your company, is that people make really weird assumptions. I'm not saying they make it yeah, I think they make it everywhere. And so assumptions are just really bad in general. And so I love just guiding how we work asynchronously together. How do we make decisions? What is sync time for? Can I solve problems asynchronously? How do I make a really big decision? Who do I involve? Who do I consult? How do I communicate? I think guiding that and being intentional about those things is also part of, um, of creating a safe, very healthy environment where people feel like they're thriving and doing the right thing when no one's looking. I think the moment assumption shows up more and those things aren't guided, I think that's where fear starts happening, potentially like fear of failing, uh, imposter syndrome, not really knowing if they're on the right track, not understanding what nonlinear work is, not really knowing when to arrange a sync meeting. So I like, I really like guiding it. And um, I now get to look at what the whole world is doing in terms of async work and then building, you know, taking and borrowing from companies that are amazing and doing it already and then building our own version of that. Again, if I can open source that and make it publicly available, I promise I will and I'll share it with the two of you. We have middle managers that potentially hasn't been people managers before. So I also get to build a very foundational guide for management development and helping them through sort of into this next phase of Test Gorilla. So I'm excited about building that as well. There is a bunch of other things, not shy of challenges, <laughs> uh, but those two are probably uh, the core, the core parts of my work. There's a lot of quick wins as well. I mean, if I think about just creating an inclusive language guide, we don't have that yet. And it's normal for a series A startup not to have that, 
but it's exciting to be able to contribute and start guiding folks on inclusive language, a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement that leads to belonging. So yeah, lots to build. Yeah. Um, those are the ones I'm on. very excited about. Yeah, absolutely. So on, on the adding templates around asynchronous work, uh, and if you could frame your response in like, you know, like three tips that I would give to every company that's trying to improve asynchronous work. And obviously I know that every company is different and what works for, for test gorilla isn't going to work for every company, but like, are there like two or three things that you think are the most important when it comes to asynchronous work? Great question. Or like the yes. foundational components of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's about what do we have sync time for and what do we have async time for? So reducing that meeting time, if you can, and doing that explicitly, you're going to be hiring a bunch of folks that's never done this before and that's okay. But teach them how to do that then and do it really well. If you don't guide, you know, like sync versus async, what does happen is folks just ar arrange so many meetings and just have so many syncs and have meetings about meetings and agendas, like same agendas, because they simply don't know how to do it asynchronously. They don't know that they can just ask you in Slack, hey, do you have an update on this? And so guiding that async, that what is async and sync time and what is meeting time for is really good. Internal comms is a huge deal in remote companies. So having a good guide as basic as the tools for communication to how communication works. And if you have a very direct communication environment, and if you don't, it's important to find that balance that's going to work for you because chances are you have a bunch of different cultures. And so if you don't say how you communicate, again, assumptions happen. Folks might find me very rude if I'm too direct, right? But if I say, hey, at Test Gorilla, we communicate very directly and very clearly. And so that might mean a very short answer and that's not rude. I feel like guiding those things are so important in the world of work. And it's going to be so different for a South African versus someone in the US versus someone that's based in the UK or Australia. So I think those things matter really. I'm going to ask a, uh, a controversial question. So what are your thoughts on the Slack message? Hi. <laughs> Is that a trick question? I am. Um... Wow, I would probably not be able to to respond simply because I would that that would be an expectation. Of and this more, happens like, a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, I might I might I out of kindness I might yeah. wave like yeah I might just put a wave emoji and that's it. I don't think you'll get much more out of me um, for any particular reason that I want to say hello. I'd love to have coffee. If it's someone that's brand new, again, I might want to guide them and say, hey, you've reached out. Is this something I can help you with? Can I link you to, you know, yeah. how things work? Like, I think I would immediately want to jump in and help. But at this level in this role, that's really difficult. So I'll probably just like do a wave emoji. And the reason I ask is because as uh, I've experienced this, you get the the random high message at like, you know, 4.30 p.m. on a Wednesday, and you know that behind that high message that there's some sort of request for you, and yeah. you're like, ah, I really don't want to respond to this. Like, just tell me what you want. And I remember at, at Humu, our VP of engineering, Sophie, she put together like a uh, guide for how to reach out on Slack. And one of her Love best that. practices was don't reach out with hey or hi. Like <laughs> nobody, nobody wants like that pleasantry. They just want you to tell them like what you need. So yeah. th that's why I was asking the question. Good question. I think sometimes there's a bit of nervousness around that, that high as well. And so my empathy is high. And so I might, I might just go, Hey, what's up? What can I help with? Like, why are you reaching out to me? But it's not always possible. Um, but I agree. I agree with Sophie. I love that she created a guide for that. Kudos to her. Yeah, one of my biggest surprises when we had Darren Murph on our show and he like walked us through like everything that GitLab has done. And I just was, my mind was blown about how much intentionality um, goes into building yes. the tools that you're describing. And, but it, it doesn't stop there. Like, it, you know, it, there's information architecture and there's accessibility of this information. And, 
I just like, for me, it was like, oh, wow. Like this is literally, you know, the foundation, uh, the, the information and the documentation that is then shared and easily accessible is the foundation of the company and is like part of the cultural fabric because you, you manager of one for me means like, I can find the information I need. I can self-manage because I the company has provided and invested time, dollars, and resources in creating this foundation. And, and then that's when I began to understand like, ooh, this seems like a different type of culture building. It, it clearly, obviously, it's a different type of company altogether in, you know, in so many different ways. But I, I realized like, wow, this is, you know, what I think. Darren is saying here is like the way you build the culture is even different. And, and it starts with a lot of the, the things that we were just talking about, probably why you're so excited about launching these, these new, these new programs. And so I, I want to talk about building culture and I want to talk about how you build a, an intentional culture using the tools that you've described and then, you know, doing it in a way that will align your employees managers and leaders, everyone around a set of company values. And like, what does that mean? Are these the same old concepts? You know, do you look at them slightly different? Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you've approached this at the organizations you work for, or maybe, you know, what you're thinking of for, for Test Gorilla. Yeah, and listen, Darren is right. I mean, we often have these fun conversations where we literally like, do you have time for coffee this week? Like, can we please catch up? We're both now in new environments. He's at Indela. I'm here at Tess Gorilla. And so we really get to just catch up and soundboard on things that we're creating and like the differences, the similarities, et cetera. An amazing guy. Love connecting with him. He said something to me. So I will add this. He said something to me like, do you realize just how ahead someone like Sid was when he created GitLab? And that is probably another reason why that was such a great experience for me and why I think I was able to take that to remote work with amazing people like Yob and his entire leadership team and, and company and now bring, bringing that to Tess Gorilla. I think it's because he was so ahead that un, that clear understanding for single source of truth. I mean, it's actually genius. If I look at enterprise companies and the amount of efficiency they would create, if just if they take five minutes to write a process down, and if they just start now with what they have, the impact it would have in one year is incredible. I think a lot of folks are so scared to start. And my recommendation would be just like, write things down like every day and learn from engineers. If you think about like code reviews and, and how they really document around what they built and how they did it and why, it's for those future engineers to be able to iterate on their code. This is the same thing. So I do want to say, I think we've borrowed a lot from engineering and great engineers and great engineering teams. And that art of iteration is something I is completely instilled in me. It's not instilled in everyone. It's certainly not instilled in the world of work yet. Um, but back to culture. So based on how you, you guide asynchronous work, so how you work together. I think culture has a bunch of components. I think there's a the, the, it will really depend on the narrative. If you're building a high-performance culture, you should also say what you're not building. So if you're building a high-performance culture, but it's not growth at all cost, finding how to describe that is difficult. Because the moment you say high-performing culture, people are going to think about a few big brands that we all know that does have a high performing culture, that's also got a burnout culture, right? And so how are you gonna be defining what that narrative is behind the culture you wanna build needs to be crystal clear and start with that. So if it's high performing, what are the components of that? Or if it's an inclusive culture, or if it's a culture of belonging and kindness, like build it on that and then find what, what components need to fit into that. One of the biggest ones is that strategy the company strategy and the bigger mission and how people align to that. I think often people get let go or go through an involuntary offboarding because they simply can't align to that bigger mission and strategy and they keep finding barriers not to get there, right? And so instead of finding opportunities, they find these barriers not to be able to reach that bigger mission and, and bigger strategy. I think that's number one. I think if the company has values, there has to be 
values alignment and weaving those values into day-to-day -day work, operationalizing them. So you, they become tangible. You can literally see the value in like the emoji you create for it, or you can touch it in offsite, or you feel it in an engagement survey and they actually write down, this relates back to our value of ownership or transparency or ambition or being proud of my work or being bold, whatever your values are. Weaving that in is critical in culture. And then all those different cultures you have. So if you are a distributed company, every single culture, every new person you add is going to impact your culture and is going to help it evolve. Chances are it's also not going to stay the same. If you don't have intentionality, that big word you mentioned earlier, it's going to happen organically and it's not going to happen in the way you want it to happen. I, I, I often see with assumption even comes back channeling like automatically. So the moment someone is assuming something, they're going to tell someone else this is what they assumed. They're going to create, they're going to plant this little seed, create this little bias, and this like weird silo back channeling effect happening. But if you tell people, this is our culture, these are the components that made it made up of that, how you show up for mental health, how you show up for benefits and perks. Even if you are super frugal, there are great ways to build that into the company, right? So I think it's about those key components, choosing what they are, naming them, being explicit about them, and just rem remembering there is a social component, but your culture is going to be formed about how you work together, probably 90% of the time. And then making space and intentionality for social connection is going to be core and crucial to have those bonding and, and fun moments. And at Test Gorilla, you know, have you had enough time to kind of soak it, soak it all in and get a clear understanding of kind of where the, the culture is and where you may want to go or maybe some in evolutions of the things that, that are currently in place? And, and I guess what my question really is, is do you have to nail this at the beginning and to, to really get it right? Or can you evolve it and adapt it over time, you know, maybe midstream? It's like, oh, we got a series A. So now things are changing and expectations are different. We're still going to keep, you know, certain elements like this isn't a growth at all costs culture, but we may need to lean into some other things that just that weren't on our radar before. So I'm just curious your thoughts there. Great question. It will evolve. I think if anyone even chooses values or decide a company culture is just always going to stay the same, I think they're only misleading themselves and everyone else that's following them. It will evolve as the company grows and changes. And I think Darren has this very nice statement. I'm hoping I'm going to remember it now. Reminiscing the past. If you are going to reminisce the past and, oh, but I really liked it when we were 30 people and stay stuck on that moment, it's going to be very difficult to stay current and to keep evolving with the company that you're in. And as you go through these different challenges and different stages, especially a VC-backed company, right? It's such high risk. If you think about it, you're not profitable yet. You don't know if the traje trajectory is profitability or IPO yet. You don't know what those dates are yet. So, I mean, this this it's high risk. You really have to onboard, be on board with this journey. I also see folks reminiscing enterprise company cultures that they actually didn't like. That's always the weirdest one for me, right? They're like, yes, but at this company, we did it like this. And I'm like, yeah, you were 80,000 people. Of course you did it like that, right? We were 100. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to do it that way. So I think it's, it, it is really, it's going to evolve. Here at Test Gorilla, I can almost guarantee it's going to evolve as well. I love that the co-founders really care about culture. They really want to nail it. At the same time, they know it's going to change and evolve as we continue to grow. They are not growth at all costs. They care about meaningful growth with very clear goals and very clear objectives. And they, so something they, they did mention early on, which I really liked is, they, they were very founder-led, and now they want to be leadership-led. And the work those two people have done to get us there is incredible. I went to a leadership offsite, which I think was so meaningful in my first two months in the UK, in person, met with our entire leadership team. And I could clearly see, I could that, that was tangible. I could see the work they were willing to put in to make it leadership-led versus founder-led. And that excites me. And I think a lot of founders in early stage startups, especially that's still very small, 
also believe they have all the answers. They really don't. They've never been a CEO and COO. These two folks are willing to learn from experts in certain areas and critical areas in the business. Um, and that's that's been really nice to see in the first two months. And I think that's going to, it sets me up for success. It's going to have the the outcomes we need to succeed in the space. Um, yeah. So we've talked about this a lot on the show, but you know, part of building a really great culture is having like a killer onboarding experience, right? Like that's your introduction to the company. Those first 90 days that you're at Tescarilla, like that's that's setting you up for everything that's that's gonna come and really giving you an expectation of what you should expect. So I'm curious, like I, I know that onboarding has been a big focus for you and in, in past roles at both GitLab and 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 remote. Are there like any big, and I don't even want to call them failures, but like moments where you thought something that you were testing out on the onboarding side in a fully distributed environment was going to work out and it totally flopped. Like, were there any flops that ultimately led to an iteration that, that vastly improved the onboarding experience that you've carried with you through today? Great question. I, um, I didn't always know that the onboarding experience starts when someone accepts the offer. I think like at some point in my life, I had to realize that and it was a GitLab and um, that tiny change where we started actually talking about onboarding, setting expectations, letting folks like that transparency about what's coming next and knowing that they, they their onboarding starts on that day was game changing. It was game changing at remote as well because that mean that just means I could do it a lot sooner, right? So GitLab, I probably did it at about like 300, maybe 400 when we were already 400 people. At remote, I could just do it when I joined, which was at 70 or 75th. I think I was employee number 70th. And so the impact I could have just by learning that like silly iteration was amazing. And I I think we we must do it at Test Gorilla. We're not doing that yet. I'm iterating on onboarding. Marie in our talent acquisition team has been amazing and created a great experience. We are going to make a bunch of iterations together and we're able to do it based on people's feedback. So this is the second one. Using all the valuable feedback that you get on a monthly basis from all the folks that you've onboarded is going to be your best iterations on onboarding. GitLab's entire onboarding was built on people's voices. And so I always feel like I designed that experience with other people that contributed to that by just listening to their feedback. And it it, it was amazing. Look, we also had an, a complex intersection by building it in the product, right? So we built it in Git on an issue. And so that was interesting. And to scale and automate that was a lot of fun um, and really risky and really difficult, but it was awesome. And so at remote, I could take what I learned from there, do it immediately, and then grow that out and start doing new things from there but getting feedback from folks early on and then iterating on your process based on those trends, based on that feedback you get, makes an amazing experience. And you start designing an experience for the people you are hiring, not based on what other companies are doing. So I, I'm gonna, I've got time for one more question and we're, we, I probably don't even have time, but I can't help myself. I've got to ask this question, having such an, an expert on the call with us. And, and so I'm curious, earlier you mentioned that um, there's a lot of fear around, um, I guess, branching out into this kind of more a asynchronous way of open source HR way of, of operating your, your people function or just your business in general. And you mentioned that you just don't overthink it, just start documenting is kind of what I heard. And, um, and so I'm curious, are there, do, do things like tech stack matter in for things like this? Do you really, you know, so, you know, I get that it sounds so simple, like just start documenting, but is it literally that simple? Just, I create a Google doc and I start working on the Google doc and I start sharing it and getting other people's input, or is there, are there tools that would make the process easier if it kind of like SEO and marketing, right? You can just start writing blogs, but if you're, if you use a certain tech stack, it's going to set you up for greater success down the road. You know, is there a, does the same apply here with uh, open source HR? And if so, what, what's the tech stack look like? Great question. There are many amazing tools that can absolutely do that. 
and, and I can name a great bunch of them. I think what you need to ask yourself is in docs, if I ever want to share this with a candidate, am I going to have to PDF it? And is that going to be difficult to change? And if the answer is yes, I would say hop on to the next best thing that can that's a button that go make this public and bam, like you have a handbook. And so I think it does matter. I have gone through the pain of doing docu like documentation in docs. We actually did that a little bit at GitLab, but we realized we are dog fooding the product. And so that switch was so fast and was so good and worked beautifully. And we were able to literally use our own product to build such an incredible handbook, which I think is now more than 5,000 pages. I don't know, probably more, right? And so I think, if you can level up and, and start thinking about what do I want to do with this long, long term, don't overthink it. But if you're going to want to make anything publicly available to recreate something that's in a fixed way, it's really difficult to recreate. And if that information isn't easily shareable, editable, like suggesting changes, docs can absolutely do that. So not dissing Google whatsoever. But I think it is about, can I make this publicly available for candidates to see as I build my employer brand, for folks to know about us before I join? That starts mattering a lot when you start having to grow and when you're hiring critical, critically talented individuals, right? Where you need critical skills, where you need competencies that you absolutely must have. To them, those things are going to matter. And so sharing that via PDF is painful. Yeah, or other fixed ways of text like email. Yeah, no, I've, I've wondered scale. about that because I have seen people share their uh, their handbook publicly via PDF and it didn't even occur to me that every time they're having to make a change, they're having to go update that PDF, which I imagine isn't so fun. And then yeah. recirculate it to yeah. everyone. It, it Yeah, that, that seems like that could be get very painful very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of free tools out there, by the way. So... I mean, I think remote started with a free version of Notion. Maybe I'm guessing, but I mean, there's free tools. So if you can't invest and you don't have the money, just find a tool that you at least can make publicly available and start with that. Um, it's going to save you from technical debt, but like general pain, right? That you don't need in 2023 uh, yeah. onwards. Yeah. yeah. All righty. So now it's time for rapid fire questions. So we ask these, these same set of questions to every guest. And um, well, I know we're, about to be at time. So we'll try to get through these as quickly as possible. Cool. So question one, how do you define a modern people leader? What are the traits and characteristics? It's someone that deeply cares about designing experiences for people. It's not about the policies they need to create. It's not about like a checklist. It's actually just about designing that amazing experience and just knowing they're going to impact someone's life probably for quite a short amount of time. But that impact is going to last. And so that's important. Question two, if you could go back in time and talk to a 22-year-old you, what career advice would you give yourself and why? I think perfectionist, any type of perfectionistic behavior. And so I think it's completely overrated. I definitely came from a background where I would like check all the fonts, check all the, I think it's about um, instead, shipping something fast. I'm not saying breaking fast. I'm like shipping fast, making sure it's scalable and being able to iterate. So get something live and then make it better. Um, so excellence is okay, but I think perfection in general is overrated. Progress over perfection. Yeah, All right. absolutely. Question, question three. So this is our future or fad question. Of all of the trends that we're hearing about right now, What's one that's the future of work and what's one that's just a fad? Um, future of work, asynchronous work and documentation. Absolutely. I think that's a fact. I think that's definitely going to be um, a trend that a lot more companies are going to be leaning into. And I'm excited to see that and being part of that. I think a fad, ooh, this is a hot topic. So um, if you if you get a lot of response on this one, you can blame me. But I think this whole quiet hiring, quiet quitting, quiet everything, I think that's a fad. I think there's other meaningful things happening behind the scenes that needs to be looked at. And whether that's burnout, like let's address that versus calling everything quiet hiring or quiet quitting or quiet everything. I think it's a very old um, behavior. 
And I think someone just decided to give it a new name and I'm not believing that just yet. Plus one on the fad, uh, the fad. Yeah, I agree that we're, it's just rebranding old constructs that have been here for, for a yeah. long time. Um, so the next question and, and final question before we get to the, the final tradition on the show, um, the next question, it, it's actually how we were able to bring you onto the show. And so I'm curious, and this has been an absolute joy. So I'm curious to hear your response. If there's one person that you feel is truly innovating in the people space and really pushing the boundaries of the work we do that we must have on the show, who, who would that person be? Time zones are going to be fun. So I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> uh, it's, it's definitely um, Melissa Eng. She is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Bravely. I think you must speak to her. She's incredible. Um, I love listening to her. I love uh, catching up with her and inviting her to talk. So I would highly recommend her. Awesome. We will definitely reach out and we would be honored if uh, she was open to joining us. And so we've made it. We are now at the final tradition. We call it one word, one phrase, close. We just all respond with uh, something that we want to leave the episode with as we reflect on this amazing hour long conversation we've had, you know, what is coming up for each of us? Anyone want to start? I can go first. I'll say, and it's a long phrase, asynchronous documentation is the future. It's a good one. I'll say gonna, based on that, yeah, go, go for ahead. it. No, no, no. I insist. Go ahead, Nadia. I'll say based on that comment on hope, I think after a long period of resilience, I'm excited about hope in the future. And I have a lot of hope. Um, well into the future. Yeah. Wow. Those are both great ones. Uh, mine is a bit anticlimactic, but um, I'm going to go with self-enablement. Awesome. Good one. Well, thank you so much for carving out an hour of your busy time. Even with the time zone differences, I uh, we really do appreciate it. And this is an absolute joy. And hopefully, uh, you may be open to joining us again in the future, but um, thank you so much. This is, it's been I, a lot of fun. I think this is the, the, I think you're the first guest that we've talked to from South Africa. So cool. Check on the box. Yeah. <laughs> we're trying to talk to as many people from different, from different places as possible. So, so glad that we awesome. got to talk today. Thank you. It All was right. great. It was great uh, chatting to both of you. All right. Thank you. Bye talk guys. Talk to you later. <laughs>